But we begin tonight with a lingering question from the 2016 presidential election. What was going on inside the FBI? Remember, just 11 days before the election, FBI Director James Comey announced that the agency was reopening its investigation into Hillary Clinton, effectively costing her the election. The motivation behind Comey's move seemed to be coming from the FBI's New York field office, which, according to Reuters, had a faction of investigators based in the office known to be hostile to Hillary Clinton. And then there's what they didn't announce, which was, at the same time, they were also investigating the Trump campaign's ties to Russia, a fact that never came out until after Trump was elected and eventually impeached the first time. So the question of what was going on inside the FBI was never fully answered, at least not publicly. But that's not the same, but that same question is coming up again as we're getting new reporting from the Washington Post involving apparent FBI resistance to the August search of Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate to recover classified documents. The Post reports two senior FBI officials who would be in charge of leading the search resisted the plan to do as too combative, too combative and proposed instead to seek Trump's permission to search his property, according to the four people who spoke on the condition of anonymity to describe a sensitive investigation. In fact, not only did some FBI agents want to slow down the probe, but some actually wanted to shut down the criminal investigation altogether last June, after Trump's legal team claimed that all classified documents had been turned over, which, as we now know, was proven to be false. While well, the Post points out that it's not unusual for FBI agents and Justice Department prosecutors to disagree during an investigation about how aggressively to pursue witnesses or other evidence, some of the reasons for resistance seem to relate to fear of career consequences or political repercussions, which are not supposed to be a thing when it comes to federal law enforcement enforcing the law, especially with national security on the line. And what's also concerning is that the investigation is still ongoing, which begs the question, why is this information being leaked at all? And what's going on inside the FBI now? That question is further compounded by the latest action by the current FBI director, Christopher Wray, who is a Trump holdover. And I will say that he has shown some good judgment in the past, calling out white nationalists as the largest domestic terrorist threat facing the country. But that judgment was put into question when he decided to speak out publicly for the first time yesterday on the FBI's belief that COVID-19 most likely originated from a Chinese lab on, of all networks, Fox News, the one network that's almost perfectly set up for conspiracy theorizing. Not only has Fox News been pushing conspiracy theories about COVID this whole time, but as we learned from the Dominion Voting Systems lawsuit, they also knowingly pushed conspiracy theories about the 2020 election. Conspiracy theories that turned out to be dangerous for members of Congress, the vice president, and for our democracy, and literally deadly for members of law enforcement. Which brings me to another shocking national security story. Speaker Kevin McCarthy's decision to selectively provide access to more than 40,000 hours of January 6th security footage. I mean, it was bad enough when he announced that Tucker Carlson, the chief propagandist at Fox, would get it exclusively. I mean, we know what he'll do with it, cherry-pick video, to lie to his viewers about January 6th, something he's been doing for two years. But now, McCarthy has agreed to provide the highly sensitive videos to the actual people who attacked the Capitol in the first place, some of the same people who were calling for the hanging of former Vice President Mike Pence and vowing to drag former Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Congresswomen like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez out of the Capitol by their hair. Some of the same people who are associated with extremist groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. How can McCarthy justify giving some of the same people that the FBI director called the most dangerous faction of the country access to information about the security routes of lawmakers, where their safe rooms are, as well as where security cameras are located? I mean, is he deliberately trying to give these people crucial information that they would need to plan another attack and perhaps be more successful? Because if he's not doing that, he sure is doing a great impression of someone who is. For McCarthy, it is just the latest example of him capitulating to the demands of the extremists who dominate his conference. And it comes at the expense of the safety of everyone at the Capitol, lawmakers, staff, Capitol Police. And yet all of these facts that you just heard have not stopped Republicans 
from continuing to play the victim card with the FBI, despite the fact that all of the evidence shows that the Justice Department and the FBI have bent over backwards for years and years to accommodate Trump and his supporters at every turn. And despite all that accommodation, what you're hearing today is Republicans whinging about how unfair the whole system is to them and what victims they are and trying to spin the truth on its head. Like Senator Josh Hawley, who infamously ran for his life on January 6th after pumping his fist in support of the mob. This morning, in a hearing with Attorney General Merrick Garland, he laid down the victim card. My question is, how often do you overrule FBI field agents for political purposes? I've skimmed that article. It is not, that's not an accurate reflection of what the article says. I approve the decision to seek a search warrant after probable cause was Overruling filed. the FBI agents who did not want to do so. Did you talk about this with the, the White House? The beforehand? memorandum does not, uh, that, that um, uh, Washington Post article does not say what you're saying. I'm sorry. Joining me now is Congressman Eric Swalwell of California, a member of the Judiciary Committee and, the twi and a 21, 2021 impeachment manager. And Tracy Walder, former CIA officer and FBI special agent. And Congressman, I do have to go to you first. Uh, I, I, it's kind of stunning to hear Josh Hawley um, attempting to make it sound as if it is Republicans and conservatives, and he and all of his fellow members of that committee, saying, well, they're the victims. I mean, here's Josh Hawley on January 6th throwing up his, his fist and then running for his life. In what way has law enforcement been unfair to people like him? Uh, a fist boy, Josh Hawley, is no victim, uh, Joy. Uh, he's someone that encouraged uh, and rooted for the rioters as they ransacked the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, but the story that he's referring to is really troubling, and I'll tell you why. It's because it shows that the Trump tactic of creating artificial red lines continues to work. We saw this in 2016 when he said the election was going to be rigged. And guess who was trying to rig the election? The Russians. And what did that do to the Obama administration? It made them hold back on publicly calling out the Russians. During the Mueller investigation, Donald Trump said it would be a red line to look at his finances. And what ended up happening? Mueller held back on looking at his finances. And now, when it's so clear that this guy's got you know, a trove of classified information that the Department of Justice wants to seek. He, Donald Trump is in the heads of FBI agents who are afraid that this would cross some Trump red line and that they would be called out. And so it's essentially letting him win and, and rewarding somebody's bad behavior because you're afraid of the backlash. Thank God Jack Smith and Merrick Garland and the team persisted because what did they ultimately end up finding? Exactly what the evidence showed was going to be there, a trove of highly sensitive classified documents. Right. I mean, I mean, they, and, and there's so much evidence of, of this kind of fear, right? I mean, just to go through here, what the Washington Post reported about what these FBI agents were afraid of, just what you're saying. Um, FBI agents found ways to make the search less confrontational. Oh, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me start in the beginning here. Prosecutors heard from top FBI officials that some agents were simply afraid. They worried that taking aggressive steps investigating Trump could blemish or even end their careers, according to some people with knowledge of the discussions. One official dubbed it the hangover of Crossfire Hurricane, which was a previous investigation into Russia and Trump's campaign. FBI agents found ways to make the search less confrontational than it otherwise could have been. The search would take place when Trump was in New York, not in Palm Beach. The Secret Service would receive a heads up a few hours before FBI agents arrived. Agents would wear white polo shirts and khakis to cut a lower profile than if they wore traditional blue jackets with FBI insignia. Peter Strzok, who used to be an FBI agent, said the following, in 20 years of working cases involving classified information, I never, not once, encountered prosecutors who wanted to get a search warrant and reluctant, even refusing agents, the other way around for sure. And Tracy Walter, I want to bring you in here because the evidence seems to be that if anything, the FBI is a combination of sympathetic to Trump and his supporters or terrified of him and his supporters. Well, I think it's a little bit of both, to be completely honest with you. But I think that these FBI agents have really gotten what the heart of their job is about mixed up, quite frankly, the whole idea of service over self. Your job is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution of the United States. Trump was given multiple opportunities. He was afforded every single opportunity under the sun to hand over documents. They had 
plenty of probable cause to believe that he held national security secrets. That's not protecting the American people when you say you are not going to go ahead with a surprise raid, which they had every right to do, because the reality is, is they had reason to believe that this evidence could be destroyed. And when you are sort of standing in the way of that, the head of the Washington field office is standing in the way of that, that is sending a very, very clear message that you care about self over service. And I think the FBI has really aligned themselves politically, which is so disturbing to me because I served under two different presidents and I never felt the political sway that I think that some of them are feeling right now. Then that anything is possible with hard work. And I want you to know that no matter what happens along the way, you should always believe that because it's true. Obviously, we didn't win the election today, but I stand here with my head held high. In the Chicago mayoral election, Lori Lightfoot failed to make it to the runoff, becoming the first Chicago mayor in 40 years to lose re-election. Lightfoot, a black queer woman, took office with high expectations after she was elected in 2019 on a progressive platform. But her handling of COVID-19 and social unrest after George Floyd caused progressives to become disillusioned with her, most notably for her reaction to the 2022 teacher strike, in which she told teachers who were concerned about COVID safety to get real and get back to class in person. Chicago also experienced a spike in crime during her term, similar to the rest of the country, which made her vulnerable to attacks from the right. As Ross Barkan points out in The New Yorker, Lightfoot alienated just about every ideological faction in Chicago. Left-leaning organizations and local leaders viewed the mayor with increasing skepticism, portraying her as a pro-police neoliberal. She managed to feud almost equally with two influential unions that hold starkly different political views, the Chicago Teachers Union, which is left-wing, and the city's police union, the Fraternal Order of Police, which is headed by a proud Donald Trump supporter. The police order endorsed Paul Vallis, who centered his campaign on crime, with the teachers' union backing progressive Brandon Johnson. Those two candidates won the most votes yesterday and will advance to the runoff next month. And Brandon Johnson joins me now. Um, congratulations. Um, this was a, an historic shift uh, that normally is doesn't the way, this isn't the way it goes. Uh, but you are now one of two people who's going to go into the runoff. Very quickly, what do you think the disillusionment with Lori Lightfoot was mainly about. Yeah, thanks for having me tonight, Joy. You know, look, I started my um, professional career as a public school teacher here in the city of Chicago, uh, teaching seventh and eighth graders. It's still the best job that I've ever had, uh, teaching in uh, Cabrini Green, USA, uh, a neighborhood and community that I believe people around the country will be familiar with. And um, mm -hmm. as I've worked to become an organizer in the city of Chicago, pushing for education justice and fighting for workers' rights, um, you know, Mayor Lori Lightfoot four years ago made history by embracing the very movement um, that uh, made her election and candidacy possible. And then, unfortunately, she was a disappointment because she abandoned all of the progressive um, um, promises that she made. And clearly, the city of Chicago is uh, ready to turn the page uh, yeah. on her and actually connect to someone who is def definitely uh, tethered to the movement. The, the way that this race played out, I mean, there were six African-American candidates, including yourself. There was Chuy Garcia, who a lot of people sort of remember. He was the one Latino candidate, and there was the one white candidate, uh, Mr. Vallis. It is you and Vallis who will now go head to head. Crime is a major issue um, on, at, at least according to the reporting, right, of, of what people were thinking about. You have a lot of African-American middle-class folks moving out of Chicago due to things like, you know, uh, discrimination, um, uh, law and order issues, um, you know, multiple issues causing people to leave. Um, and then you also have a lot of, you know, white Chicagoans who are complaining about crime. But the, 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 the crime rate increase, it's not even across communities. It's not evil, e mm -hmm. even across racial communities. Your campaign has said that your tack on that is to cut $150 million from the police budget, tax the rich for a billion dollars in new spending on schools, transportation, health care, mental health, and job creation. That is your campaign platform. Paul Vallis, who the Fraternal Order of Police is backing, his tack is to call it an utter breakdown of law and order, and his whole campaign is about taking back our city. He plans to take the handcuffs off police officers to stop raising criminals. That sends a, an alarm bell in, I think, a lot of black folks' heads. But your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, public safety is um, top of mind of many people. Uh, my wife and I were raising our three ch children on the west side of Chicago in the 
uh, dynamic neighborhood of the Austin community, uh, one of the largest concentration of black folks around the country. And though we love our community, it is one of the more uh, violent neighborhoods in the entire city of Chicago. And so um, we experienced this firsthand, raising three children there. And so um, between me and my opponent, um, no one has a greater incentive for the city of Chicago to be safe um, than someone who is raising a family under those circumstances. Look, the bottom line is, is that Paul Vallis um, in the 90s was in charge of the budget of the Chicago Public Schools and had budgetary um, uh, leadership within the city government. And we are in the economic uh, crisis that we are experiencing right now because of um, his failures. In fact, I was in high school at the time in which um, he blew the budget, but he did it in Philadelphia. Um, he did it in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, shutting down schools, um, uh, the loss of black educators under his uh, reign. Um, he's been an absolute nightmare, but this is someone who was also identified uh, with the extreme right wing. Um, once President Obama, uh, the first black president, was elected, um, he said he identified more as a Republican. Uh, he said he was fundamentally opposed uh, to reproductive rights and abortion. Um, here's someone who has been embraced by leadership um, that has been supportive of the January 6th um, insurrection. So um, he certainly uh, represents the most extreme aspect of the political dynamic in this in, throughout the country. I, on the other hand, um, I'm doing what works. Um, the safest cities in America all have one thing in common, Joy, and what that is is they invest in people. And so what my budget plan does, which is balanced, I'm the only person who actually released one, um, having passed multi-billion dollar budgets on the county board, um, we get at the root causes. Of, of violence in the city of Chicago while also dealing with the immediate crisis. And we do that by promoting uh, rank and file members to become detectives, 200 more. We do it by spending to make sure that the consent decree that this administration has ignored um, is um, administered with all due expediency. But we also make sure that we hire young people. Um, there's a great predictor of violence reduction throughout the country. Young people working. Um, is the greatest predictor to drive down violence. And so that's what my plan is committed to doing. It's ultimately a plan that invests in people because that's what safe American cities do all over the country. And I know that as a teacher, as an organizer, and of course now as a Cook County Commissioner. And do you, are you concerned that this sort of breakdown over the crime issue will become as sort of racially an, uh, polarized in an ugly way as it has in other cities during the campaign? Well, well, there's certainly been a whole lot of dog whistling here. And so, yeah. you know, look, you know, you know, painting um, a public school teacher, um, you know, in a certain light is something that, of course, that the, you know, extreme right wing, of course, has embraced. But as a progressive Democrat, um, I'm mm -hmm. definitely committed to making sure that we're doing we do what works. And, you know, again, um, investing in lives in young people is the best thing that we can do, making sure that we are providing mental health yeah. services to deal with the trauma around uh, the city of Chicago. That's what I'm committed mm -hmm. to doing. All right. Well, we wish you luck. Uh, please come back. Chicago mayoral candidate Brandon Johnson. Thank you. And we should note we did invite candidate Paul Vallis on the show as well. We look forward to talking to him.